Welcome back, Left Reckoners. David here, joined as always by Matt Leck. How are you doing, brother? I'm doing good, David. Good to be with you. Yeah, man. And uh, we're really stoked uh, to be joined again uh, by Sean KB. You know him from the Antifada. Uh, how are you doing, brother? I'm great. It's uh, good to be here on a bit of a reunion with you and Matt Leck, considering that Matt Leck was the initial producer on our podcast back in the old MR days. So always happy yeah, well, to talk with you guys. Was that like 1994? I think we <laughs> I believe so. It was in the it was in the Clinton administration. I know that much. Uh, remember, we had Al Gore on to talk about communization. That was dope. and the lockbox, yeah, and exactly. the lockbox. <laughs> the, the social security lockbox will be protected through communization. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> well, as much as I would love to uh, just uh, tell old r war stories, uh, we got to talk about something that's got people pretty uh, worked up, um, which is this speech here uh, from the Teamsters president, Sean O'Brien. Uh, at the Republican National uh, Convention, and it's that been a pretty sob, <laughs> sob, which is like incredible acronym, by the way. Yeah, um, yeah. and it's, it's unfortunately it's been a little bit of a slow news week, um, you know. So there's not much else to talk about. Uh, but happy we could finally get back to it. Um, I'm just going to play a quick section from it just to give everyone a little flavor in case you missed it and then i'd like to hear your just kind of like initial reaction and we can talk about um you know a bunch of other things connected to it together to form unions but for a century major employers have waged a war against labor by forming corporate unions of their own we need to call the chamber of commerce in the business roundtables, what they are. They are unions for big business. And here's another fact. Against gigantic multinational corporation, an individual worker has zero power. It's only when Americans band together in democratic unions that we win real improvements on wages, benefits, and working conditions. Companies like Amazon are bigger than most national economies. Amazon is valued over $2 trillion. That makes it the 14th largest economy in the world. What is sickening is that Amazon has abandoned any national allegiance. Amazon's sole focus is on lining its own pockets. Remember, elites have no party, elites have no nation. Their loyalty is to the balance sheet and the stock price at the expense of the American worker. So I do love that version of it too, with the Trump <laughs> split screen, because it shows maybe how far it was going. But I mean, you know, uh, just curious, like your kind of first initial reactions to the speech as, as it came out. Well, I, uh, I didn't watch the RNC live, except for the real, like the first 30 minutes of Trump's speech where he recounted the assassination attempt, which I thought was fascinating to watch <laughs> because it was like he had this crowd enraptured and he's talking about a very serious attempt on his life that, you know, would have succeeded. And I'm a, I love chaos. So like, I'm not going to say which line, which, you know, where I'd fall on that, but I love chaos. It almost happened, but then it didn't. So I, I watched that part of it, but I took, um, I took note of the of the um, O'Brien speech, though, and I sat down, watched 17 minutes of it and took notes and whatever and took it seriously as like a um, as a statement from a uh, a union leader who has what, hundreds of thousands of members under him and was trying to do something relatively new politically, something that probably hasn't been done in like 50 years in the United States, which is to try to cynically and opportunistically, and I'm not even sure genuinely, but try to play both ends against the middle, try to break out of the you know Democrat Party monopoly uh, for trade unions, try to go and suck up to some of like the worst fucking people in America in the capacity as a union leader, somebody who has responsibility over negotiating and setting the structures for the lo economic lives of hundreds of thousands of workers. So I sat down and I watched it and I took copious notes on the thing. And I think the optics of it aside, because it's obviously caused a huge, huge, huge debate, controversy within not just the left, but like labor, you know, organized labor, rank and file and leadership in general. Um, but I think as like 
boilerplate la- like labor statements. There wasn't all that much in this speech that was different. There was a lot in this speech that was, I think, attuned towards an audience that was ready to hear it. Like in that last clip that you just played, he's basically blaming globalists. He, mm-hmm. This could be like a, a Curtis Yarvin uh, statement about how the United States has gone from a republic, you know, a democracy where like native people stand up for their rights into an economic zone, you know, like globalists have come. But that's not surprising rhetoric. We shouldn't be surprised by this. And the fact that so many people on the left were surprised by this indicates to me, A, that they don't really know their labor history all that well, which is fine, Uh, but also that uh, they're pretty naive about how these large and powerful institutions work and the intersection between, let's say, economic power and political power and what's necessary these days for a deformed and corrupted union movement representing in the private sector barely 6% of the U.S. working population, the sort of concessions necessary to keep these deformed organizations running. And it's, I caught some heat online. I don't know if you guys saw that. (laughs) Did you see I caught some heat online? Some people were calling you a Nazi for saying. (laughs) I called a fucking Nazi, man. I got the lyrics to... A great song, Dead Kennedys, Nazi Punks Fuck Off, yeah. tweeted at me, which was a real blast from the past. It was like it was like the 1990s again when the Teamsters were endorsing <laughs> George H.W. Bush for president. <laughs> <laughs> well, because you, you tweeted you know, us. And, oh, go ahead. I was just going to say, like, you know, the, and the nationalism, like, the sort of thing, you know, that stuck out to me, too. But the other thing that stuck out was the specific mention of Amazon. And everyone's judging this in terms of a long-term political strategy. And I think, you know, we'll, we'll spend time assessing it on that front. But in terms of, like, a guy looking at, he's trying to unionize Amazon. And also, there's, look, especially at that point, who knows? I don't handicap elections. But a good chance that Donald Trump was going to be president anyway. Like, do you think that short-term interest is being underplayed in this discussion? Discussion? Do I think the short term? I don't. I think it is being underplayed. I think that uh, O'Brien and his speechwriters and all of the various like minds, legal, political minds within the Teamsters um, would have thought it remiss if he did not directly attack the corporations that they have been trying um, with no success or very limited success to try to organize over the last couple decades, right? Amazon being a big one. And so I'm not surprised that that rhetoric made it into the speech because I think it was a very pragmatic, again, in these like, because I have a whole take on organized labor and its history and its reality within this country as a union member myself, Mm -hmm. you know? Um, I think that hitting Amazon specifically was good if you're trying to, in a what could be called a savvy way, try to peel off um, members, certainly congressional and Senate members from the other main capitalist party if you're trying to peel them away and um, put forward a message that like Amazon is the enemy, not the workers trying to organize it, not the Teamsters Union. I mean, I see this largely in cynical and practical terms, what they were trying to do. Yeah, I I mean, I think we let's get back to the the left in a little bit because I think that's like a, a bit of a a, a different conversation. Um, but I want to you know bring up one of the big critiques, and it's one that I, I like just putting my cards on the table. Man, Matt and I have talked about it. Um, you know, is that like it doesn't necessarily bother me that a labor leader wants to to speak to whatever forum will have him. Um, sorry, you know, it's just like go and do it. Um, now. Do I think that there is some kind of maybe risk of praising a Halley or a J.D. Vance? Uh, yeah, I do, um, just because I think that Vance's uh, and Halley's support of labor is extremely hollow. But so is the vast majority of the Democratic Party. Thank you. Um, Thank you. Yeah. You know, so I think, like, there's like there, there's a tension here, and I think it's, it's worth looking at, like, does this— aid uh you know our 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 class enemies i mean i view vance howley and trump as class enemies um 
You know, I think that there were a lot of people, just the optics of it, who sort of treated it as an endorsement, right? Just be very clear, because so many people are confused about this, and I think this is a bit of an issue, actually, um, is that people do think that, oh, Sean O'Brien, the president of the Teamsters, came out and endorsed Trump in, you know, in front of the nation. That's not what happened. He spoke, um, you know, to this the, to this Republican national um, convention. But yeah, I mean, you know, just throwing it to you, um, Sean, I mean, like, you know, do you have like the, this kind of anxiety here about like, I, think, I guess what I'm saying, just put, put a point on it to ask a clear question. Is that like, what bothered me the most was when he was saying that he liked a guy like Vance and a guy like Hallie, who I yeah. think are full of shit, frankly. I mean, try to put yourselves in Sean O'Brien's shoes. Try to put yourself in the shoes of a large labor organization that except for the UPS strike relies, and we saw this with the pension bailout during COVID, relies by and large, as most unions do in the United States, even private sector unions like myself, relies by and large on either government regulation or different policies or National Labor Relations Board appointments, relies on the state and its various policies in order to survive, organize, and thrive. Is it a mistake to try to cultivate uh, members, congressional members of the other party out there who may have made some sort of nods towards organized labor in the past? If your fulcrum and your lever for organized working class power is fundamentally the state itself, and it's not to say that they haven't used um, the strike and industrial action, for example, uh, in the UPS strike to great effect, but by and large, what is organized labor in the United States but like a labor regime of labor peace whereby the government arbitrates between capital on the one hand and legalized workers' organizations on the other and to try to, to come to some sort of understanding between the two that allows unions to slowly and slowly decline year after year but make sure that something like a generalized labor insurrection doesn't break out, to make sure that le leaders like O'Brien are who workers look towards you know, when their rights are threatened, to make sure that at the end of the day, it's the lawyers, it's the legal minds <laughs> at the International Brotherhood of Teamsters who are the ones that make you know, the most difference and that have the most effect on uh, the conditions of people's work their pensions and whatever. What O'Brien's, this is like, if I've got my practical, pragmatic, like member of a deformed workers organization um, analysis on the one hand, I also have my commie Marxist analysis on the other hand. And the vast gulf between those things is like absolutely terrifying, right? Like what should workers organizations be versus what they are? But what I reject and what I've been reacting to, and I got in a lot of heat after, what was it, January 6th? Now that October 7th happened, January 6th and, 7th, and October 7th always gets muddled in my mind with all the crazy shit happening over the last several years. By the but way, I, guess what day Trump got assassinated? No one remembers that day, but go on. I remember because it was of an important day for me. It was July 13th. Okay. But most people don't remember. It was like the day before a, an important personal event. Um, 7-13. Yes, 7-13. Great year, great day. Um, the, where was I going? Um, I lost my train of thought. You, you were, ta you were talking about the, 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 the gulf between your Marxist understanding of what work oh, yeah. organizations should be doing. And, and when I got in trouble around January 6th, it was on a matter of principle. Which is, I, and I tweeted this out just as I tweeted out about the Sean Fain, or Sean O'Brien thing, and I got called a Nazi then, I got called a Nazi this time, which is that people on the outside of these organizations, people on the outside of organized labor, right, they want to impose all sorts of like restrictions on the politics and the practice of these organizations, which is fine in an ideal world. In January 6th, I got in trouble because I said that libs, Progressives, leftists online shouldn't be gunning for a union boilermaker, sending emails and making a million calls to his union to try to get him thrown out for being at the January 6th protest, thrown out of his union, his livelihood lost, because that matter is a matter of internal union democracy. 
If the Boilermakers want to throw him out of his union for being part of the January 6th insurrection, that's up to them. That's not up to you on Twitter. That's not up to you at Act Blue. That's not up to you within the Biden campaign or whatever. Because as much as these, and this is the gulf, right? As much as these, and I could go into a long hundred and something year history of this, as much as these are deformed and degraded and corrupted, ultimately business unions that we have in this country, due to various historical factors, due to the very particular labor regime, labor law regime we have in this country, there is still the nucleus of something that people from the outside shouldn't fuck with, Mm. right? You can make your suggestions, you can write papers about it or whatever, but like what happens in the Teamsters is first and foremost, not only, because right, they are like a lodestar for the broader organized labor movement and in a small sense for the larger working class, but in a fundamental way, what happens within the Teamsters, what their leadership is, who their leadership is and what their leadership does is fundamentally a Teamster problem. Hmm. So if you're coming at it, and I read the Alex Press article, which was really great on this, talking about, to various rank and file t- uh, Teamsters, Teamsters who were in charge of locals, Teamsters who were delegates, Teamsters who were involved in the pension funds and all that stuff. These people we should listen to. We should listen to them because they are part of this larger organization. You from the outside with your leftist views, with your progressive views or whatever, you can have your opinion, but be mm-hmm. humble. Mm-hmm. Have some humility about this because there are people who fight in the fucking trenches of this shit every day. There are union reform movements, and as much as I have issues with the Teamsters for a Democratic Union, mm-hmm. who have been fighting you know, for shit like a no-concessions president like O'Brien for many fucking years. And you can't just sail in on your fucking... So I almost said sail in on your high horse, but you can't just like ride in on your on your high horse someday and say, oh, the Teamsters are moving towards a red brown alliance and fascism and blah, 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 if you don't have any fucking skin in the game. And I mean, that's my main fucking thing. And, I, and you know, and, and I, I feel your your anger here again, like, you know, I think that there's like, again, like a tactical, practical question that's like worth hashing out, right? Um, but frankly, I saw from a lot of the way that certain folks were reacting to it um, was like, if particularly people who are very close to the Democratic Party, like a kind of ownership thing. And look, I like again, I don't think that there's a lot of there's a lot of, you know, I don't think that there's a pot of gold at the end of this rainbow. Right. With alliance <laughs> with Trump Vance and all these folks. Right. Yeah. I think it probably is a tactical mistake. But um, I don't think that the, the, the teamsters should feel beholden to the Democratic Party. And I think particularly people who aren't even (laughs) like leaders or influential in the Democratic Party to feel like so personally aggrieved uh, by this, you know, I found to be, you know, very odd. Um, And it's it's been an interesting. It's not odd, though. It's not odd at all. We feel it's odd because we don't, you know, we, we look and we say, aren't these independent workers organizations? Shouldn't they be like able to do whatever political action it is that they see fit? We see it as like. Who the fuck are these people in the Democratic Party to be like, why did you leave our plantation? But Sean, you know, you know it's it's, but, yeah. it's it's not just unions, though. I mean, it's like what's another kind of left wing thing that they always say is like, oh, this group of people are voting against their interests, blah, 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 as if like you own their interests. Right. You know, it's right. Like if, you, if you believe in like workers emancipation, if you believe in like workers democracy, all these kind of things, you also have to be able to like have people, um, you know, you can, you have to be able to see somebody say like, "Hey, I think that you're wrong," but not because you have a false consciousness or you don't understand what it is that right. you're doing. We just have a disagreement here, right? And it, 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 it is that lack it's of politics. Grace. Yeah, I, yeah, it's politics. And what and what the debate about this has been has been a foreclosure of politics, mm. which is why I made clear in my minion death cult appearance, which was great, and People also we listened to it. Thank you. And this left reckoning thing too, which is that. We need to take union politics seriously. And when I got in heat, it wasn't for endorsing SOB's appearance at the RNC. It was merely stating, which is a fact, that when I went into the shanty, you know, Mm -hmm. on break, and and everybody, not everybody, but many of them had watched the RNC, one thing that resonated for the people in my gang, like the people I work with, union guys, was the message of corporate misdeeds and corporate greed. Good. And also union functional independence from either political party, Democrats or Republicans. And just that sense, right, just that indication that 
the working class and its deformed and degraded institutions might break off, might break away mm. from the Democratic Party, might try to forge their own path is frightening and terrifying to many, many people. It's understandable on the Democratic Party because they don't want to lose the fucking money. They don't want to lose the canvassing. They don't want to lose the prestige and imprimatur when SOB or Sean Fain steps up, calls Trump a fucking fascist and says that you have to vote for the Democrats or else, you know, the sky is going to fall or whatever. But like we, all of us, whether you're involved in the labor left or not, should be more critical than that. And look at the real substantive, opportunistic, and cynical, sure, uh, reasons why SOB might go up there and address the RNC. Look, and all I'll say is this, is like, yeah, there's a lot of people in that crowd who we disagree with, um, but also is it any more ridiculous for a union leader to go and speak at a DNC and maybe have one of the number one union busters in the country, uh, Howard Schultz, <laughs> there you go. smiling in the audience? Now, yeah. I want to get to this, this other bit, though, too, because... Um, uh, one more ridiculous and I think one more practical. Let's can we talk a little bit about this, you know, red brown alliance? Because it's something I, uh, you know, all three of us, we've been, you know, you know, we've been not just on the left for a while, but like on the online left for a while. It is like this severe anxiety, folks. And it's all people, you know, people talk about it all the time. I mean, you initially for just saying, hey, here's an experience from my life as a working man, right? As, yeah. a, as a union worker, people are like, wow, you're a Nazi. Um, you know, can we talk a little bit about this like red brown anxiety that we get yeah. all the time whenever we talk seriously? Um, I don't know. It's, I don't even know what it is that triggers it, but whenever you sort of step outside of a typical Democratic Party politics in a lot of ways, I, I know what it is, which is that it goes all the way back to the 1930s and it goes back to um, the CIO and the Communist Party USA uh, and to a lesser extent the Socialist Party USA forming a popular front with what's called progressive forces. In this case, it was Franklin Delano Roosevelt. It was the liquidation of and the subordination of an independent, strong, powerful, independent working class movement in the unions and outside the unions. It was their subordination to the Democratic Party, which is the context of all of this. And we've lived now for 80 something years under this conception that the interests of the left and the interests of liberals are fundamentally the same. We just sort of disagree on how far we want to go, right? Organized labor subordinating itself to the Democratic Party is a fundamental building block for the entirety of not just the post-war order, but the neoliberal order. And now whatever the fuck it is that we're going into now as we see this post-neoliberal order arising, Labor is supposed to, A, be subordinated to the progressive forces, which is to say the Democratic Party, and it's also supposed to be subordinated to the state. It's supposed to, and this is the way that the NLRA and later Taft-Hartley and other laws are designed, it's that the cause of the working class as a junior member of a political coalition of the Democratic Party can best be realized by ensuring that the courts the labor courts are stacked with the right people. Now, the vast gulf between that and the way that organized labor and the working class, the socialist, communist, and anarchist movement understood the cause and the mechanisms of workers' justice in, say, the pre-1930s period, that gulf is vast. Some of us on the left, and we're, the, I guess, the people who are calling for a red-brown alliance, recognize the subordination and liquidation of autonomous workers' institutions into the state and into the Democratic Party and say, if we want to further the cause of workers, even in a reformist way, the working class has to have autonomous and independent organizations of its own that can bring to bear leverage, persuasion in the building of its own interest as separate from the rest of the actors within capitalist society, its interest to build that politically, economically, and whatever. That appears to many, many people as a red-brown alliance thing because the cause of the, of the popular front has been completely, completely coincided with the cause of the working class in this country. There are those of us who still imagine that things could be different, 
But the reason you get called Red Brown Alliance is that, and you guys know because you cover this day in and day out, that the greatest mechanism for trying to subordinate people to like genocidal policies like it's happening in Gaza right now, corporatist policies like it's happening all over the fucking country, um, pro-cop policies, and I'm talking about the Democratic Party, the best way to do it is to point to Donald Trump and point to the other ones and say there is no alternative. And if you don't go with us, you're supporting the fascists. Mm. And where my analysis of this, and many friends of mine, and the ILC analysis of this uh, shifts is to say, Donald Trump is a lot of things. But if we look at the history of American politics and American society, the tendencies that Trump expresses should not be interpreted by us in European terms right, in the terms of Italy in the 1920s or Germany in the 1930s, not because there aren't some overlaps between those things, but because we need to take American history seriously. We need to take American political history seriously, the history of the popular front seriously, and American labor history seriously. So where I get bent out of shape about this shit, and I try to be really cool about everything all the time, but where I get bent out of shape about stuff is being call, is, is people calling, say, Sean O'Brien a Nazi or what the Teamsters are doing as a Red Brown Alliance thing. When the Teamsters endorsed Reagan, George H.W. Bush, and Richard Milhouse Nixon over the course of 20 something, 30 years, like within mm-hmm. living memory. So this cynical and opportunistic cozying up to the Republican Party, playing both ends against the middle thing, is something that's happened like within my lifetime. And now because of like the, the, the hothouse nature of American politics and this real fear of like fascism coming to our shores, as opposed to just bloody, terrible, imperialistic, corporatist Americanism, which is what Trump is, blinds us completely to the political reality of this. But of course, also the political potential of what real working class independence and autonomy might mean, which means our own institutions and our own movements separate from the popular front and the Democratic Party, and, as Sean O'Brien refused to do, separate from the ghoulish Republican Party. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think that that's a, you know, a a pretty decent way of of putting it. And I think, uh, you know, people should definitely read, um, in addition to going and listening to your appearance on uh, Minion Death Cult, which is a program uh, I'm a big fan of as well. Great program. (laughs) Yeah, it's a lot of fun. Really Um, fun. Uh, there's a really great piece in Jacobin by Dustin Guestella, who's a, is a guest of this program a lot, who wrote about this kind of being a return uh, to Gompers. Um, you know, yeah, Gompersism. Yeah. Um, and and what and I think what he put it is that like, hey, there's you know, th- this is an out of bounds politically. And, you know, and by the way, just for people who don't know, Guestella is a, is a Teamsters member as well. Um, you know, this is an out of bounds, but the, Gompers was a, was a sign. Uh, Gompers like kind of tactic of pitting. You know the Republicans and Democrats against each other was a sign of weakness, not of strength. And what mm-hmm. he means by that is like it was because the Democrats weren't. I'm sorry, the, the sorry, Jesus. Uh, it's because like organized labor was not able to build up like an alternative working class political articulation that it was sort of left to see. Okay, what can we do with these two big gangs? Um, you know who might give us concession here, a concession there, right? It was a defensive. And you see, the, I mean, this is a lot of American politics, frankly, when it comes to the working class. Is like is defensive. Um, yeah. You know, you hear that. That's you right. Know, um, so, and, you know, I, I thought that was a very interesting way of seeing it. And for me, I think more than anything is like the initial tactics of somebody like, uh, you know, Sean O'Brien. I have my opinions on them. I've made them them clear. But what really frustrated me about this entire episode was less so when we think about whether or not that was a success or not a success. But it was just the fucking really, really um uh, selfish, self-centered way that a lot of people were reacting uh, yeah. to something like this without having a lot of conception of, of what that meant uh, for yeah. working people, particularly uh, for Teamsters. Yeah, no doubt. Having not read the piece you're referring to, um, you know, I, I'd be remiss if I commented on it. <laughs> but knowing a bit about the history of uh, Samuel Gompers and the, uh, and the American labor movement, as you say, this shouldn't be surprising to us. You know, Gompers was initially a Marxist Mm. uh, as a cigar roller organizing that union. He was a Marxist uh, who ended up running the AFL, uh, American Federation of Labor, in the 19th and early 20th century. 
And as his politics developed, he became, and people don't want to hear this either, something of an anarcho-syndicalist, but like a right-wing anarcho-syndicalist. So American unionism, definitely in the private sector, right, as it's primarily been, has been imbued with this sort of individualist mm. syndicalism, right, where the big battles in the 19-teens and 1920s over was this going to be a socialist syndicalism, and they won briefly, and then they lost big time under after Gomper's uh, great victory, right? Is this going to be like a socialist syndicalism, or is this going to be a capitalist syndicalism? And as it turns out, Gomper's, as an anti-socialist, not a Marxist anymore at that point in time, was able very persuasively to push the conception of bread and butter unionism, that where the unionism in the United States in this land of the free home of the brave is not about the political the economic and political organization of the working class becoming a force unto itself and bringing about the overturning of this order and the deepening and broadening of democracy towards like let's call it a cooperative commonwealth which is what people called it at the time but instead that just fighting for better pensions better death insurance better conditions um, was sufficient, but even Gompers is, and I hate to say this because I'm not a Gompers apologist, but even Gompers was, um, was more progressive in a sense in that he understood that um, the structure in place, the interests of capital versus the interest of labor meant that the fight was going to continue forever. It's just that he wanted to create the strongest uh, and most conservative a uh, fighting force for the working class possible in the land of the free, which was the conservative business union, essentially, right? Mm -hmm. As it turns out, that entire sort of like opportunistic, and as we see in, in retrospect, uh, overly optimistic view of what was possible for organizing the working class in this country passed on to all of us, certainly those of us who are in private sector unions, right? This idea that like, we can make a deal with the bosses. They can make profits. We can get higher wages every year. Everybody can be happy. If there is a conflict, we're not going to deal with it with strike measures. We're not going to deal with it um, by, like, um, I don't know, Coleman situ strikes. We're not going to deal with general strikes or whatever. We'll deal with it um, at the bargaining table, and we'll deal with it through, like, a grievance apparatus and, like, mm. a legalistic apparatus that tamps down on shop floor struggle. And ensures that like the cooler heads will prevail in the union hall and in the in the corporate office. And that had a nice run up until the 1970s. And we all know what happened then. But like Gompersism and O'Brien is like a reflection of that Gompersism, mm -hmm. but without even the sense that like you could carve your own path, right? And that like organized labor, sure, we could play both ends against the middle, but like for what? Hmm. For what? There's no vision there. Just a, at least vision. At least the vision of Gompers was like the American worker will have the highest standard of living in the land. Now labor's been beat down so long. It's like organized labor using political power by cozying up to the Democrats or maybe the Republicans can stop the world historic defeat that's been laid at us for the last fifty fucking years. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it, <laughs> when you when you think about, it, I mean, the stakes are extremely high. Uh, but you think about what it is, I think, on the political side that people are trying to defend and realize that, yeah, I mean, th these are like very almost conservative fights in the terms of yeah. it's like you know, quite quite literally like conserving, um, you know, past victories. Um, I w I don't want to keep you too much longer. I want to just open it up to you if you want to say anything um, about the uh, realignment folks. So I think though, in fairness, probably were the biggest winners, uh, the people who think that we're going to create this new conservative, this pro working class Republican party. I don't know if, if you have any thoughts on that. If not, that's fine too. It's, it, it could never be pro working class, right? I mean, is what they, what they consider that is like getting working class votes and like using some sort of, uh, state measures in order to like ameliorate conditions of the market to ensure that uh, the big corporate players are like giving some pittance to the workers, but importantly that their real base, which is like petty bourgeois middle class type people can continue mm -hmm. to create new small businesses and innovate so that they can exploit workers, you know, more in that venue. 
it couldn't be a working class party as we understand it as socialists, right? But what they want to do, I think, is um, fundamentally impossible right now, which is to try to, I don't know, split the difference, split the baby between like being pro corporate, pro extractive industries, uh, pro American manufacturing on the one hand, but also somehow have a labor force cheap enough that a, a capital would want to exploit it. Mm. Like you can't, this is the fundamental problem is that you can't have the American working class as the consumer of last resort and this like entity upon which a million different industries from like payday loans to health insurance to like various legal scams could just parasitically like suck all of the fucking money out of them. You can't have an American working class that's the consumer of last resort, but also have the American worker cheap enough that you can exploit them and lead to a renationalization of, imagine, of industry. Could you imagine what the Cigna uh, revolt would be like? <laughs> if, <laughs> you know, if we think about the Brooks Brothers revolt back in the day, the Cigna oh revolt God. would be, um, you know, much bloodier chapter for sure. <laughs> <laughs> so I think the whole, I, 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 in answer to your question, I, I think they're, they're chasing a shimmera. I don't, uh, I think that like the Hawley people and uh, JD Vance and Donald Trump to an extent are like, I don't know, they have false consciousness themselves, right? They don't really understand the treacherous waters that they're in right now. They understand that what we call neoliberalism, what they would call globalism, is mm -hmm. failing. They understand that while the economy seems good right now, profit rates still aren't great, and China's kicking America's ass and all sorts of stuff. So they understand that tariffs need to go up. There needs to be like some sort of sorting out of like geopolitical blocks of trade or whatever. We need to con con like continue subordinating Europe to our interests. All this shit. They understand that, but they don't understand the contradictions at work and the contradictions at play. And it's not up to us to educate the Republicans on like the fundamental contradictions of capitalism. It's not it's my job. To, it's not my job to educate you, <laughs> but it is up to us to like understand what happened with SOB at that convention as part of like the working out of various contradictions and ultimately and i don't want to leave this on a dour note because i'm actually very uh, optimistic and maybe we can talk about my yes. our project but like this is maybe like the crystallization or the beginning of the end of this entire labor regime that we're in right now not merely because of uh, judicial picks uh coming down the pipe which in our lifetimes maybe the next four years might invalidate the National Labor Relations Act as unconstitutional, mm -hmm. right? Where there's all these nods towards organized labor from the from members, a few members of the Republican Party, when this hasn't worked on its own terms for 50 fucking years. And it's incumbent upon all of us, people who are in labor or people who are allies of labor, to start to anticipate what the terrain of struggle might look like if and when, and it's looking like when at this point, this entire conversation we're having about, oh, the how many board members are on the National Labor Relations Board? How is Davis Bacon? Is it going to make another vote or whatever? That is in the process of self-destructing. So we need to look at this as an opportunity to start to imagine maybe bridging that vast gulf between what we have right now and these degraded, corrupted, opportunistic business unions that pass for representatives our interest of our interest, that on the one hand, and like the ultimate goal, which is workers' power and workers' autonomy, which has to come through workers' independence. Mm. This is actually a very, very good moment for us right now because we can start to see these cracks, we can enter these cracks, we can start to think about ways that we might make real our imaginary world where we're treated with dignity and maybe like have some fucking potential to to live a life not scraping by day in and day out and where people have yeah fundamental rights it's possible i think well, i think it's possible i mean i i do share and people do sometimes will comment on these videos and be like you know david's bumming me out i was like i'm actually i i share your optimism i think a lot of things are possible right now um yeah. could you i mean I, I this is i mean if, if you'd like to talk about the ilc um you know we'd love to we'd love to to hear about and share it out Folks. yeah no i like seeded it already because uh this is like our main shit that we're on it's it's like the our banner says uh break the popular front 
and what our group is, the Independent Labor Club of North America, and hopefully beyond North America, is a reconstitution of our forces, uh, a recognition that starting a new political party will only get you wrapped up, whether it's going to turn into a sect, right? It's only going to get wrapped, you wrapped up in this spectacle of like two party politics. You'll end up being parasitic upon one of the two of them, like the Green Party trying to take votes from the Democrats or whatever, MAGA communism trying to take them from the Republicans, whatever the case may be. Also, because uh, well, in that labor... case, just trying to eat up the Communist Party's old membership. Yeah. Or <laughs> but... That's a hell of a schism happening right now. That'll be interesting to watch to movie for. If you guys want to have me come back in six months, we'll let's do it. Yeah. Where that thing fucking lands. But uh, it's interesting. We should see these all as interesting. We should see these as like symptomatic of something. We should be Marxist and maybe even Hegelian about these things and be like, what is like the unity between the shit libs and the American Communist Party? Is there a unity there in, in, the, in, in, the, in the opposites? And it is actually the popular front. It's this notion that like state power, that like the conquering of administrative power, political power, legal power over the state is the bourgeois state, is the way that working class independence and autonomy will be birthed, will be brought into the world. And then we'll have dungism if you're a uh, if you're an American Communist Party person, or we'll have like super new deal if you're uh, a left liberal type person. What we argue at ILC is that like those two are unities of opposites, and what we need right now is a reconstitution of working class independence, which can't happen politically, and it can't happen in the unions because everything's in flux and everything's against us right now. So we offer a free association, a club, a place where people, militants of any stripe, people who are apolitical even, can come, and we start to constitute the working class as an independent force within society, starting out in civil society, bourgeois society, meeting together, discussing together, debating together, smacking a, da a gavel down, not wearing robes, we're not going that far, right? But taking lessons of the way the middle class organized itself in Kiwanis clubs and Elks clubs and whatever, mm -hmm. taking lessons from how the ruling class organized itself in country clubs or whatever. I almost said Freemasons, but we're not like that too. <laughs> and Bohemian understand. Grove. Bohemian Grove. Oh God, no, we're not like that either. But the point is, is that these civil social institutions were a way that like society within like capitalism could still have some, some like community to it. Mm -hmm. So we think that, the working class needs that for itself, which is why we have a chapter in New York. We have a very strong chapter in Arizona. We have a chapter in, we're working on a chapter in Chicago, Montreal, Ottawa, and Melbourne, Australia. And it looks like maybe we're making some outreach to Colombia and Mexico too. This is the dream. Mm -hmm. You know, the dream is like an internationalist movement that can be like fundamentally and truly internationalist and working class that can start to begin the pre-political process of like understanding where we're at and where we need to get to. Uh, it's very optimistic and we feel really good about it. And so that's the Independent Labor Club of North America. Maybe I can send you guys a, a link to it, yeah. but uh, it's exciting times and, uh, and growing times. That's our thing. 100%, we love it. And also people should certainly be uh, checking out listening to the Antifada as well. Uh, John, I really appreciate you taking the time, uh, and we'll definitely have a link below for people to check all that kind of stuff. Out. I love talking to you guys, and I'll uh, I'll invite you back into the Telegram for the ILC. I'm sorry you got booted. No worries. And um, no, you guys are doing great work, too, and it's always a pleasure to be with you guys. So anytime you want to have me back, Thanks, bro. I'm ready. Thanks, Sean.